Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. Looks like we have folks uh, trickling in. We're just a minute before the hour. So I think on a Friday, we'll just give folks a few more minutes to, to come in and sell in, and then we'll get started. Just get comfy. See some more people coming in. Um, we are just at 10 o'clock. And I think we'll just give folks a couple minutes to keep trickling in. I see people joining. Um, I'll start with just a little bit of housekeeping in a moment. Well, I guess I can say, and I'll just repeat it. Um, we everyone's muted just to make it a little bit smoother on the audio side so just a heads up and if you have questions you can use the chat box uh, in the GoToWebinar platform and i'll be monitoring that and we'll be recording this as well so i can repeat all that housekeeping in just a moment but hang tight uh, and we will kick off in a couple minutes All right, um, it is just after the hour and I do see some people still kind of trickling in, but I think we can just get started. I'll repeat some of the housekeeping stuff I was just saying. Um, hi everybody, thank you for joining today's kickoff webinar for Digital Equity Outreach Month. It goes without saying that this is a particularly challenging time and we know folks have a lot on their plates, so we really appreciate you being here. Um, just a couple housekeeping items again before we begin. So uh, everyone's been muted for the webinar just to make sure there are no weird, you know, audio snafus. Um, if you have any questions, please use the questions chat box in the platform. Uh, I'll be monitoring it throughout and we'll be sure to address those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A session. Um, if it's a quickie that we can quickly um, slot in, I, I can, you know, bring that up to the presenters as well. And lastly, we will be recording this, and the recording and the slides will be sent out to everybody following the presentation. So uh, you'll have everything that we're going over today. And with that, I think we can get started. So I will pass things over to Rachel to kick things off. Uh, good morning. Um, welcome to Digital Equity Outreach Month and our kickoff webinar. Uh, my name is Rachel Shemlin. I am the E-Rate and Broadband Consultant with the Department of Public Instruction, and I'd like to introduce our speakers today. My colleague, John Rauf, uh, product owner of the WISE Data EdFi Integration, also with the Department of Public Instruction, and our nonprofit partners with the Education Superhighway, Eliza and Grace. And before I um, turn it over to Grace to share a little bit about Education Superhighway, I would just like to give a big shout out to Education Superhighway. They've been um, a wonderful partner with the Department of Public Instruction for many, many years, at least 10 years. Um, the founder of the Education Superhighway is actually from Madison, Wisconsin, so we're very proud of that. And um, the work with the Education Superhighway has increased back in 2015, the, the data collection efforts and work that the nonprofit did increase category two funding for school districts. It's one of the primary reasons that category two funding increased from 2.5 billion to 4 billion. Uh, and also after that, um, realizing that districts, schools did not have a way, schools and libraries to compare internet pricing and what they were getting for their pricing. So um, a compare and um, 
a comparison tool was created for schools to use. Now we're partnering with Education Superhighway for the next step, which is um, really extending um, and understanding what um, connections are like for students and families when they're not at school or in, in their libraries. So I'll turn it over to Grace um, to share a little bit more. Thank you so much, Rachel, um, for those really kind words. And uh, you know, I feel like you just did our intro <laughs> for us. So, so appreciate that. I can just talk a, a quick bit. Sorry, my camera's not working, folks. But um, I'm Grace Ting, State Engagement Director at Education Superhighway. I'll mostly just be moderating today and supporting our presenters, uh, but wanted to just pop in quickly and tell you a bit about who we are. Um, Education Superhighway is a national nonprofit with the mission to connect all K-12 students across the country to high-speed broadband. Um, our focus has long been on school connectivity, and, and like Rachel was just talking about, we've worked with Wisconsin for quite a while. Um, but when the coronavirus pandemic hit this past spring, we launched an initiative to help states and districts navigate the connectivity challenges associated with the shift to remote learning and the home access challenges. So um, we have been partnering with DPI to support their digital equity gap data collection efforts. And we've developed guidance, tools, and resources based on best practices and learnings from districts across the country um, to support districts with assessing home access need and determining connectivity solutions. So we have a, a site just for this initiative around home access, digitalbridgek12.org, where you can learn more about this work and access all of the resources that we'll be sharing today. So feel free to check that out. And I should also just call out uh, that there has never been a cost for any of the work we do or any of the tools or resources that are available. So with that, let me just go to the next slide here. Um, this is just a bit about what we are planning to cover today. So uh, I'll be handing it back over to the DPI folks in a moment to just talk a bit about the digital equity data collection effort that is underway. Um, then we'll hand it over to my colleague Eliza, who will be talking about um, a couple of districts in Wisconsin that we've been working with on a pilot to, to sort of test out some of these strategies and resources that we'll be sharing today. Um, she'll then talk about this playbook that we've developed and an action plan um, to help guide you through uh, being able to you know, take action during Digital Equity Outreach Month and then we'll wrap up with next steps and the Q&A. So with that, I'll hand it over to John, who I think is gonna talk a bit about um, the DPI's Digital Equity Data Collection Initiative. All right, thank you, Grace. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, you know, one of the, the big things that our team does at DPI is we're responsible for uh, connecting the student information systems to the state, um, primarily for required data that you have to send to us for accountability. But, uh, you know, the digital equity data collection became a, a critical uh, data set, not really for accountability purposes for the reporting you have to do there, but more so so that we can make sure we close digital equity gaps uh, throughout the state of Wisconsin. So what I'm going to talk about is just the efforts that we at the state um, the EDFI um, Alliance, which is um, tied to the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation, uh, Education Superhighway and the CIS vendors did to make sure we drive a consistent set of questions uh, as well as answers, and then to consolidate that and provide a uh, consistent method of collection. So um, we'll, uh, we'll discuss that and, and go through that. So why is this data collection so critical? Um, you know, in the past, some of the data that we've had um, available has told us that there's a percentage of students without home access, uh, but that's that's somewhat helpful. But really what we need to know, uh, really right now and, and into the future, uh, is we have to know which students specifically don't have access so that we can act quickly. Um, you know, a lot of this data can be used and will be used um, to drive uh, state and federal funding in the future. But really that initial uh, key points that we need to know are um, the ability to uh, target resources to students uh, that need 
uh, either a device or need internet access. And um, then just also um, relating the home digital access to uh, the learning outcomes for that, um, for those students. So the challenge, the efforts that the districts had to make, um, and I wasn't in a district um, on the ground in the spring, uh, but the things I heard, the stories I heard, I know the stress levels were uh, significant and the work that all of you did uh, at the district was um, very heroic. Uh, you know, just being able to collect any data about digital equity gaps um, in that time uh, was just a fantastic effort. The challenge though was inaccurate responses potentially uh, because you're gathering it on the fly, uh, the collection process itself being fairly inefficient in some cases. Some of you might have had a really great uh, streamlined process in place already, um, but then also incomplete uh, data sets. So that in lies the, a little bit of the challenge here. So in the next slide, really what we needed to do was provide a few different methods to uh, standardize the collection uh, and do the, that with some common data points with six common questions, um, and then also having the same set of answers so that uh, you know when the data is looked at, whether you're looking at it at the district level, whether we're looking at a state level, or whether um, when it's looked at at the federal level, they're they're looking at um, similar data points across states even um, to help uh, drive decision making. So number one, uh, we did publish the common data points, those six common questions. So if you wanted to create your own survey, you could. And I'll show you this um, uh, this link here in a second. Number two, um, and this is where my team came in. Um, starting about the end of May, we pushed really hard with the student uh, information system vendors to number one, uh, create a common repository in their student information system for you to collect this data. Uh, most of the student information systems uh, have completed that work uh, as of uh, the beginning of August. And uh, secondarily, for them to wire it into sending it to WISE data. Uh, and now the digital equity collection is optional to send to the state. But um, as you'll see throughout this presentation, um, it's to your uh, advantage to um, provide the information to the state. Um, and again, uh, those um, that'll make more sense as we go through these um, slides. And then uh, additionally, number three is providing a free Qualtrics survey for districts, six uh, common questions, those same six common questions. So if we click on that link there, uh, the broadband, dpi.wi.gov forward slash broadband, uh, you'll see on that page uh, some key information that's available um, to you as a district. And um, additionally, up in the upper left there, there is a link that will take you to another page that um, provides the uh, survey questions. So that internet survey tools link and provide the Qualtrics survey link so you can sign up to get a unique survey link for your district. And then just a little blurb there on the student information system data submission. Um, I'd recommend that you reach out to your student information system if you do not have the um, information on where to put that in your student information system or how to uh, report it um, to the state through WISE data. Okay, so this next slide uh, just talks about the six common questions, and then I'm coupling that with the criticality of the student address. So first and foremost, the dedicated learning device. So these three questions, what device does a student most often um, use to complete schoolwork at home? Is a primary learning device, personal device or school provided? And then finally, in a really important point here is the primary learning device shared with anyone else in the household. Um, obviously, if you have multiple uh, students in the household that are having to share one device, um, the uh, opportunity for the student to complete their work on time and maybe at the high, same level of quality um, could, could be compromised a bit by having to share that device. Sufficient internet access. So um, 
you know, number one, do they have access to the internet from the residents? Um, what is the primary type of internet service at home? So things like broadband versus satellite um, could uh, result in a different uh, level of reliability and performance uh, of the service. And then uh, finally, and this is a critical point with a lot of the virtual learning now being uh, live streamed or um, videos that are not uh, downloaded locally, um, can the student stream a video on a learning device with no interruption? And we're already starting to see some of this data come in and I'm seeing uh, a, a pretty good mix of um, students indicating that they can't always um, view videos without interruption. So, and then finally, student address. So um, this data is critical up here, the dedicated learning device and the internet access. But when you um, put that together with the student address uh, coming to WISE data, all of a sudden we can take those six questions along with the address and um, put that on a map. And again, you'll see a little bit more about that later in the presentation that you as a district could look at. And if you share it with the state, obviously we can look at it to see those digital equity gaps around the state. So both collections are optional to send to WISE data, but I just advocate that Okay, in the next slide, um, these are digital equity dashboards. Uh, this is something that is being built in our WISE Dash tool. Uh, it's coming soon. This is a free tool to districts. So if you uh, do turn on uh, sending of the digital equity data to the state, you would be able to check this on a daily basis to number one, see how this is trending for your district. And then also, have the ability to drill in to see which students, for example, don't have internet access. So one consolidated place. And then if you build that into your district process, um, you're not having to run separate reports and those types of things. So that is coming soon. And I'll turn it over to Rachel. Rachel, you are on mute. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> so thank you, John. I really appreciate um, you sharing all of that information. Um, as John alluded to, once a district has detailed information about students that need um, connection in their household, um, DPI has developed in partnership with CESA Purchasing and the Digital Matrix um, a series of protocols and tools to make this process easier for districts, a one-stop shop. And so um, we can go on to the next slide. And so when you go to the site uh, for CESA Purchasing Digital Learning Bridge, um, there are directions for how to get started. Um, it's possible to send, and we would ask that you send address files for your students to DPI through a secure FTP site. And then we can send, in turn, send those files to um, vendors to see which um, addresses they could provide service for. When you're on the Digital Learning Bridge site, there are links to, if you could go to the next slide, please. There are links to internet service providers, hardware and software providers that have all uh, negotiated discounted services to help bridge this gap. And so, um, this is a one-stop place for districts to find uh, discounted services and for what they need. So here's a slide that shows how this works with the secure data. So um, districts and DPI would need to have a data use agreement in place. And then in turn, DPI will have a data use, has a data use agreement in place with a variety of vendors. So this is showing some of our internet service providers that we have data use agreements for, and there are many more uh, also listed on the Digital Bridge site. And so when a district uh, signs up on the digital bridge to get started, um, it generates um, a process and a protocol where 
we send you a secure data use agreement file and a sample data file through the FTP site. Once those are returned, DPI sends those to the other vendors. And when we get the results back, then we send them back to the district. So all the district has to do is send us the initial data use agreement and the address files, which allow us to get you that detailed information for a variety of vendors that service your school district's area. And um, also on the Digital Bridge site is an, a list of providers that are available for each district. Uh, what, the real benefit uh, and why this program is new is in the past, districts uh, really only had the option of getting hotspots for families when they knew that they needed access at home. Um, through this service, we have wired uh, wireline providers, um, terrestrial providers, so that the school district can contract directly with the internet service provider. And then once they have permission from the family to have that service installed in the home, it's a broadband service installed in that home and the contract would go through June 30th. And so there's no hotspot necessary. And this is also a solution for, um, for districts that um, maybe are outside of coverage areas for the hotspots. So I would encourage you to go back to the Digital Bridge CESA Purchasing Digital Bridge website and click on the number one on that homepage and get started uh, with us and generating those specific data files for your school district. Hey, Rachel, um, we have a question that just came up that I think we might yes. as well address now because it's timely, which is from Angela at Great Lakes, and it's how much of a discount is offered? Okay, so place? that's a great question. Um, and when could you go back a couple slides sure. um, to the one with the gray background, that one? Okay, so when districts go here, um, the number three is the comparison of vendors. There's a matrix. And so, um, and so uh, districts can go there to view the actual discounted pricing and compare services. Um, like I said, at DPI, we're really trying to make this process a one-stop shop. Um, and take some of the stress off, off of districts who are trying to collect, connect their households by providing these tools and these processes. Rachel, we have one more question um, about yeah. this as well. If you have a student, if we have a student that is not in the CHOICE program, would they be able to access the digital bridge? And what if the student lives just over the border of Wisconsin but goes to school in Wisconsin? Will they have access to this benefit? Okay, so those both of those are great questions. And um, the digital bridge and CESA purchasing is the discounted pricing that was negotiated with vendors. So the question about whether it would be eligible across the state border, that would be a question for CESA purchasing. Um, and their contact information is on their website. Um, as far as which student, what was the second question? It was about... Um, if the student uh, is not in the choice program, would they be able to access this? So these discounts and the um, digital bridge program is available for public and choice and private schools. And so um, it's it would be up to the school district to make that decision about um, contracting service for a family. Great questions. All right, then I would like. Um, Sorry, to... <laughs> no, <laughs> just go one ahead. More question. Lots of yeah. interest in, in this topic. Um, so, is the contract with a family or with the district? Who pays? Uh, great question. The 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 um the um contract is with the school district, and the school district pays the provider directly. What the school district would do is obtain permission from the family to have a service like this installed. Great. Sorry for just jumping in, nope. but it felt like that's okay. <laughs> and I, um, I've had a series of webinars um, about, and Ed Snow did a series of webinars about the digital bridge. Um, I plan to add um, a, a link to one of those recordings sometime next week. It'll be on the um, the DPI website for broadband that John was showing before, where the internet survey tools are available. That's where we'll put the recording. So if you'd like to know more about the digital bridge, that, that will be available. Okay, so um, 
we know that um, districts are having to um, pivot at, at a moment's notice to try and work hard to address these gaps. And um, for September, we're launching, DPI is launching Digital Equity Outreach Month as part of a nationwide effort to address these equity gaps and to help us um, gain a better understanding of which students are impacted by lack of access or uh, they're underserved by the quality of access that they have at home. So what uh, we're asking and encouraging is that districts take um, part by assembling sort of a team and creating a plan to connect with families that maybe you haven't been able to reach previously so that um, you have a better understanding of the support and what their needs, digital access needs are. Um, our hope is that at the, um, at the, at the end of Digital Outreach Month, that you'll have a more complete picture of what home access needs are uh, with the specific data points. And then you can share those findings with DPI as well as connect to the variety of discounted options available through CISA Purchasing's Digital Bridge. So I'm going to go ahead and hand things over to Education Superhighway, who will be sharing some of the tools and resources that they've developed to support districts in organizing their outreach campaigns for families. Thanks so much, Rachel. All right. So, um, hi there. This is Eliza Strain from Education Superhighway. Um, as you just heard, DPI is launching Digital Equity Outreach Month uh, to support districts in reaching their families for connectivity data. So while broad-based surveying, um, as John mentioned a couple slides earlier, like SurveyMonkey and Google Forms can be useful for estimates and percentages, our goal right here is to get actionable household level data with addresses so that every student can get connected. Okay, um, so that is why we've created this playbook and action plan that focuses heavily on leveraging direct outreach methods like calling families. So direct outreach is critical for data collection because as we all know, there are barriers to participating in online surveying, especially for families that are struggling the most right now. Doing direct outreach, meeting them where they are, is the most equitable way to reach all families. And from our observations at Education Superhighway, participation rates from families will be higher with direct outreach. We have seen up to 80% response rates from direct outreach versus 30% response rates with a broad survey. Direct outreach also increases accurate responses because it allows for a check and understanding with questions that are sometimes difficult for families to interpret. Finally, direct outreach allows for a high quality touch point to have a two-way conversation and conduct a more thorough needs assessment, especially during this time that we're in. Okay, next slide. So I have actually been working on this uh, data collection effort with two Wisconsin districts who you heard from on the July 28th Digital Learning Bridge webinar about their experience with data collection. So in July, I worked hand in hand with Brian Casey from Stevens Point and Tim Peltz from Racine Unified to launch their direct outreach campaigns. Both districts use a broad-based survey form in March, just as schools were closing down, but were not satisfied with the quality of data collected. Thus, we came up with a plan on how to directly reach out to their families about their connectivity status. So at Stevens Point, Brian's goal was to understand the connectivity needs of his around 6,800 students to know where he should distribute his district bot hotspots. They tried a new method of texting, which gave their survey questions a more personal touch. This direct outreach component made all the difference and it raised their survey response to 55%. For Racine, they had 35 staff members call and reach out to two K through eight schools. This direct outreach was an incredible opportunity to build connections with their families and highlighted the value of having a project manager on the ground to organize, train, and support callers. So in conclusion, both Racine and Stevens Point did this direct outreach in July and are now integrating the common questions into their new Chromebook device agreements. Ideally, many of you have been incorporating the common questions into registration, device agreements, or some other process that is associated with your normal business operations. Hopefully, this direct outreach and playbook can be a wonderful complement 
or a concerted way to reach the families you have been previously unable to reach. So, um, now that you would have your data collection and would like to see where your connected students are in your community, there is going to be a mapping tool that we are developing with DPI. This tool augments and complements the digital equity gap data collection effort and the digital learning bridge connectivity offerings that John and Rachel talked about earlier. It bridges the two sides of the equation by enabling you to visualize the data you are collecting and see which internet service providers can connect the students who don't have access. As you can see here, this is Stevens Point data that we uploaded into the, this initial version of the tool. You can see you can filter by school, grade, device, whether they, ha they have a device or not, um, and internet access. Those black and gray dots you see right there represent connected and unconnected students. So what to do with this data and provider options. To help with procurement, we've also pulled in provider service data. So you can see provider options for every student address. We have both residential broadband listings and LTE coverage listed for hotspots. So as you can see from the yellow dots represented, um, that represents where US Cellular, for example, can serve Brian's unconnected households. You can also download this provider data in a spreadsheet that corresponds with each household to see which provider can serve which student. So you may be wondering, how do I get this cool map? Uh, the three steps outlined on the slide on this slide right here shows how this mapping process will eventually work once all the pieces of the map creation are in place. So first, the district would share this collected data with DPI via WISE data from their SIS. Second, DPI will feed the data into the mapping tool behind a secure login so districts can leverage their data. And third, DPI will refresh data in the map as districts share updated data as close to real time as possible. So in the meantime, if you are finished with step one, and would like to see your connectivity data in map form, you can reach out to Rachel to determine next steps. All right, so we learned a little bit about Stevens Point and are seeing what they've done and this really cool mapping tool, but you know, how do we get there? How do we get this data? Um, especially if perhaps you're starting at square one or you've had some uh, mis mistrials in the past with collecting data during this very stressful and chaotic time. Um, so basically, given the importance of this data collection and digital equity outreach month around the corner, we've created this playbook and action plan that school districts can use for their home access needs assessments. We know this is a chaotic and stressful time, and there is a lot of importance in knowing which students have access to online learning because it's really essential for this, their success if they can't be in the classroom. Given that, we have created a ton of resources that you can use as needed in this data collection effort. We understand that every district has its own unique resourcing needs right now and challenges it's, it's facing in the beginning of the school year. We want this playbook and action plan to be a support system, not a source of stress. So the action plan that I'll be going over in the next slides has been informed and validated by best practice research the pilots in Wisconsin I just spoke about, and across the country, we've also had pilots, and input from experts in family engagement and large-scale outreach campaigns. The playbook is a step-by-step -step guide that provides templates, tools, and resources to run sex successful data collection campaigns that supports DPI's digital equity gap data collection effort. Over the next few slides, I'll describe the recommended key steps that make up the playbook. The intention is, this, is for this to be something that a district leader can pick up and execute when you're ready to collect this information. And do not fret, we'll be sending this deck to all participants. So all these cool resources I'm talking about will be at your fingertips um, real soon. So you're here, you're, you've committed to start collecting data, um, but before you get started, there's some preparation that needs to happen. So a few things that need to be lined up. Number one, you should identify your stakeholders with your district that need to either contribute or approve the program, perhaps like a superintendent that, that you need approval from. 
Um, once that approval is secured, we recommend having representatives from your communications and SIS team join this working group that you're creating and become owners of assignments throughout your campaign. And those assignments I'll be talking about in, in the next slides. Second, reviewing any previous home access data collection efforts is essential so you can incorporate what did or did not work in those efforts and which households you should reach out to. Perhaps you got a 20% response rate or 30% response rate in your previous efforts, so you perhaps don't need to reach out to those, to those folks since you already have their data and their connectivity status at hand. All right, so you've created your team and now you're ready for step one, which is, um, which is launching your data collection effort and recruiting the callers who will be responsible for doing the outreach to families. For the next couple of slides, just to reiterate, I'm gonna be calling, I'm gonna really be focusing on how to create a direct outreach calling campaign because we found the most success with that with our pilot districts and from all the previous um, expert research I mentioned. So the number of people you would need to recruit depends on the number of households you need to contact, how you'll be contacting them, and the time frame you set. We've developed a really cool nifty resource calculator that can help you determine the right number of callers based on how many households you wanna reach and how much time you have to reach them. Once you know the number of callers needed, you can be recruiting staff or volunteers who will conduct this outreach. Across our pilot programs and best practice research, we saw the best results when those doing the outreach have some connection to the families and understand the local context, whether they be teachers or volunteers from parent groups or community-based organizations. You should also ensure that you can reach out to families in their home language, especially if you have ESL speakers in the district. Finally, you may consider providing compensation specifically for this effort if district school staff, school, school staff um, are working overtime. Though volunteers can also be successful as long as you're providing the right tools like training and structure, which I will cover later. All right, step two, customizing communications materials. So the next step is customizing communications both for your callers and to prep your families that there's some outreach happening. To support direct um, outreach to families, we've optimized scripts and follow-up emails and voicemail scripts to capture complete and accurate results in the most efficient way. These scripts will guide your callers through each survey questions, which should align with the common questions from DPI. It's also critical to send communications that will notify your families of the upcoming outreach and help them know what to expect. We've created a social media toolkit, as well as a website for newsletter copy language, um, website and newsletter copy language that can provide ground softening ahead of direct outreach so families know that a teacher or a volunteer will, will be calling them in the next week or so. With all these materials and templates, you should of course feel free to customize for your district and local context. So step three, setting up your outreach tracking and data collection tool. With your callers identified and communications materials drafted, it's now time to prepare for outreach. The idea of this step is that in order to make sure you're collecting data that can be tied back to each student, you'll need to track that at a student directory level. We recommend working with your handy SIS group team member to pull contact information for each household that you'll be reaching out to. On this slide, I bolded the essential data fields here, um, like student name, primary parent name, phone number, um, um, email address perhaps if, if that is relevant and you want to be collecting more up-to-date information while, while you're calling. Um, it's also um, great to have grade level and school attending on this tracker as well so that you can personalize conversations with each family. So this outreach and data tracking tool um, that we have created that I'll be talking about in the next slide can support this step. Ultimately, whether using this data and outreach um, tool that we've created for you um, or tools like perhaps if you're very advanced like an auto dialer or texting software it is critical that any data collected can be tied to each student and household I know we keep on saying that but it's so important to visualize and understand where your unconnected students are right now at an address level all right Step four, so automate, oh, um, this is actually no part of step three. So I'm showing you the outreach tracker tool that we've created right now, a little screen grab of it. 
So our team is committed hey, to... Yes. Sorry, just one second. We got a comment that the slides aren't visible. I just wanted to do a quick check, oh. uh, make sure that folks can see. I don't know if it's just uh, maybe one person's connection or if everybody's having issues. So just a pause real quick. Yeah, of course. I, I can see it. Just You can see if anybody could just... Let's see. Um, okay, somebody's saying they can see the slides, so I think we're all good. Thank you for the feedback. And then um, somebody's asking, would Excel work? So I think that's kind of what you're about to hit on with yes. this tracking tool that we've developed. And uh, so I'll let you continue on. Sorry for the interruption. No worries. Thank you so much, Grace. Um, and again, we'll be sending these slides out after the session. So if, if there's uh, some technical difficulties, you'll have you'll have it soon. Um, so yes, um, this outreach and tracking tool that we've created is it is basically a very magical Excel spreadsheet. Um, we want this um, tracking tool to be available um, for free and Excel really is the uh, most widely known uh, um, free um, service there is out there to to do this data management. Um, so fantastic. So this, this magic sheet is basically automated um, and has some really amazing um, features to make this process as painless as possible. Um, with the pilot districts, we did this work um, a little bit more manually and um, even for Excel wizards like ourselves on our staff, it was a heavy lift. So we really tried and, and put a lot of effort to make this tracking tool um, as automated and easy to use as possible. Um, so basically, the outreach tracking and data entry tool will allow you to assign households to each caller. That So there's an even distribution and language alignment with each caller. It will generate a separate sheet for each caller that is pre-populated with contact information and structured to capture every survey question response that you're asking. Um, it will track the progress of the outreach campaign, so it'll let you know when you're 10%, 20%, 30% done. Um, it will also aggregate all home access question responses in a dashboard format, as well as a master list that can be important to your SIS um, and sent right along to DPI if you so choose to do so. All right, so we're almost done. So many steps and we're really going in depth in this um, so we can really give you just like a get into the weeds access. But again, this is supposed to be helpful and um, it's really up to you on how you want to leverage each of these steps, uh, but we want, really want to be thorough as possible so it can um, be a one-size-fits-all approach. So Just one one moment and again, <laughs> Liza, um, now we're having some people saying they can't see the slides again, that it was oh. okay before, but now they can't. So I can't see it either, yeah. It might, it might just be my driving. Um, I don't, I'm trying to see. I, I see it, but sounds like maybe you guys don't. Um, Natalia, I don't know if you're on, if you have any, let's see, Sherry is saying, saying waiting to view Grace Ting's screen. All right, so it's definitely me. Let me. There we um, go. Yeah. I see, better. oh, I see your desktop now. How about that? I see it. Oof, you guys have been looking at my desktop. That's not a pretty sight. All right, back, back to, uh, <laughs> back to the presentation. <laughs> Um, fantastic. So I am on <clears throat> slide 30 right now. Um, so I think you got to go one more slide over. Um, there we go. Okay, we're good. Okay, so the last step before actually conducting the outreach is to create a schedule for callers and train staff. So basically to like go back, you've created your amazing working group team with all the players, your communication staff to help with um, you know, outreach to families to make sure your scripts look good. You have your SIS team member that's pulling those directory level um, uh, lists for you. Um, you're using um, either our magic Excel tool um, to input um, all the, the list that your SIS person um, uh, pulled and you've identified your volunteers um, and basically like you're, you're ready. You're ready for this outreach. Um, but first, you have to train your callers um, and train staff who are calling. And this is really essential and a really great learning we learned from um, pilots across the country. So we recommend first setting up shifts or specific blocks of time for your team to do outreach. These should be about two hours in length 
Um, and we found that the best time to reach parents is either on a weekday evening or perhaps weekend afternoons. Again, this is ideal and we know that this is a, an unideal time. So I think um, making it work in your um, incredibly busy um, uh, schedules um, is, you know, do what works best for you in your community and your callers. Um, you should also have a training session. So the training session of how, um, of basically the script and what the run of show will look like um, will provide important context about the data you're collecting for your callers. And it's an introduction to the scripts and the tracking tool and helpful tactics for getting complete and accurate information out of every conversation. You can use this training as an opportunity to set expectations with your callers and confirm logistics like schedules. And fret not, we've created all these resources um, in terms of how to train. So we have a training presentation, a, a script that goes along with the presentation. So you just pull up that uh, this slide deck that we've created and your script is right there to just read off of, um, as well as caller instructions and tips that we have for callers, especially ones that maybe haven't done calling before and could be a little nervous. We've tried to create as many resources and supports as possible for this effort. All right, step five, conducting the outreach and collecting the data. So with all that hard work and preparation in place, um, we're doing the outreach itself now. You'll wanna leverage your communication materials that we created back in step two to first send out a broadcast either on social media or both on your, on your website or newsletter to all families. It'll again, give families context on this data collection effort and can preempt any questions that they might have and when you are getting in touch. Um, we recommend using the channels that get most engagement from parents, whether that be the district's Facebook page, website, or the school's messaging platform, or you can do all three if you want. Um, after the broadcast, your team will start reaching out to families based on the schedule you've established, and they're gonna be leveraging that script and tracking tool that you have set up for them. Um, we've seen a concentrated effort over a week can yield excellent results, though of course you should work with a timeframe that makes the most sense for your own goals and team. Um, we really recommend reviewing progress regularly um, and holding frequent, frequent debriefs to support your callers and make sure um, that um, issues aren't coming up or roadblocks are not happening. So, you're ready to begin, but you have questions about this, these many resources uh, that, that I've just spoken about. A lot of information, I know. Again, we'll be sending out this slide deck after the webinar so you can download the action plan and the associated resources with it very easily. So, you know, in closing, we know there's a lot going on right now um, and that each of your district landscapes are incredibly unique. And this action plan is an attempt to be a support system for your team. And we are here to clarify any questions you may have. So given that, I will be available from 12 to 3 p.m. Um, every day the first week of um, September to consult on any questions you may have about the action plan and its resources once you have reviewed it. So you can set up a time for um, us to chat on the Calendly link on this slide. Um, and again, as Grace mentioned in the beginning, um, all of this is for free. Any conversations we have is free. So just wanna be here as a support since this is a lot of information to download. Um, and that is the end of my slides. Um, I will pass it on to Rachel, um, who will be wrapping it up with next steps. Uh, thank you, Eliza. Um, that was some great information for schools. Uh, so you're probably wondering about the timeline for this. Um, we know that a lot of you are already um, taking these efforts on. You're partway into this process. Some of you are thinking about this process and haven't started yet. But basically with the start of school, um, it's time to create a plan and assemble a team and start to con and conduct that outreach campaign to get the specific residents data um, internet connection data for your families. Um, there is technically not a deadline for collecting that data, but we know that it's timely with the start of the year and with making decisions about um, connecting to discounted services and equipment. Um, in September, we're having Digital Equity Outreach Month. That's why we're kicking it off today with this webinar. 
um, that's when you'll train your team and continue to reach out to families and collect that data and get it into your student information system. Between August and October, um, continue to share that data with DPI uh, by uploading it to your student information system, um, sending a file via secure FTP, um, those address files so that we can um, scrub it against the vendors available and um, we'll start looking at those dashboards that John uh, mentioned earlier. Next steps uh, will be feeding the data that we receive into the mapping tools and then providing districts with access to their map so that um, you have that very detailed information for working with stakeholders and community leaders to improve and close the digital equity gap for children and families. Okay, I think we'll um, go to Grace to see if we have any other questions. Okay, so I'm back. Thanks for bearing with all the little technical glitches. Very supportive group here <laughs> with all your feedback and comments. I think we only have, and if I if I missed anything, feel free to chat again. Um, but there was one question that says we have families that don't have internet available in their area to be installed, are providers going to expand their service? Um, yes, so this is a really great time for me to touch on the fact that through the Public Service Commission, the PSC, there is a broadband expansion grant, and that grant is one that would be, uh, has to be written by an internet service provider, but it's in collaboration and in support with the, um, support with the local school districts, um, and any other community organizations that can support that application. And those broadband expansion grants are available for, they're prioritized and they're available for underserved areas and completely unserved areas of the state. Um, so if you've, um, the first step in determining that would be to go to the Digital Bridge site, click on step one, and uh, begin that process of sending your, your data files to us so we can confirm um, at a specific address level, whether a provider can provide service or not. And uh, feel free to reach out to me directly with any questions about the Digital Learning Bridge or about the processes that we've um, described today. Great, um, let's see. We have another question that says, would staff members that can't get service also be covered by this process? So, so is it just um, for again, student families or just, or okay. also for, yeah. So again, that's a local uh, decision for districts and schools to make. Um, the CESA um, purchasing, um, CESA purchasing um, are the partners that have negotiated these contracts with the providers. I'd encourage you to reach out to CESA purch purchasing with that question, but it's my understanding that it's a local decision. All right. Um... Let's see, I don't see any other questions in the queue at the moment, but we'll just give folks a minute or two, see if anything comes up. And while they're doing that, just to reiterate, um, I know we shared a lot today on the education superhighway side with, with a lot of resources and just wanna reiterate what Eliza was saying is that you know hopefully the deck is a useful sort of lead behind resource where you can link to everything and you know, take your time sort of navigating through and picking and choosing what may or may not be useful. Um, and she will be available as support the first week of September as folks, some folks anyway, may be kicking things off. So I don't see any other questions. I think we're just about time anyway. Give you, give you the last seven minutes before, oh, one more question. What is the difference between using a hotspot and left hanging um, and contracted vendors? So with that, that's a great question. With a hotspot, um, you also would have a contract with the vendor, but it's a wireless connection uh, through cellular or wireless, mobile wireless LTE service. Um, the wire connection is um, another option for districts to compare so that they can make the most informed um, decision about pricing and whether or not they want to have a hotspot that they're checking out and collecting again or go with a wired service directly into the family's home. So just more choices, more options, but everything in one place on that digital matrix 
for districts to compare. And here we have another one. Um, how can we receive a copy of PowerPoint? So we will be sending out the recording and slides uh, following this to everybody who both attended and registered. So you should get that soon. Um, let's see. A question from Andy, are the wireless hotspots unlimited or capped uh, in terms of the data plan? Uh, great question, Andy. Uh, when you go to the CISA purchasing digital matrix, it's a spreadsheet that compares providers and you can see all of those details on that spreadsheet. And that link is in the deck too. Lots of links, <laughs> um, lots of good information. All right, let's see. Um, do we have to have a response from each family? Is a question. Um, no, you. I mean, I think that in an ideal world, and if this is in, please let me know if this is not in response to the surveying. Every family, you reach every household um, because every student deserves um, access to online learning. If that is what your district has chosen to done at any point in time, but we also recognize it's very difficult to get to 100% 100% response rate. So I think, um, as I mentioned before, combining multiple methodologies is a great way to approach it. Just like Brian and Tim did from Racine and Stevens Point, doing direct outreach coupled with their device agreements, which also has the survey questions attached to them. So just trying to figure out um, how to meet families where they're at. Um, and this direct outreach is just one way to really reach families. Yep, and just to underscore that, I think you know the the point of the September effort is to really just catalyze folks and rally people together to take action during this focused time frame. But obviously, this isn't a one and done, and it's going to be an ongoing process. So I think John, definitely correct me if I'm wrong, but because um, DPI has done so much great work in you know getting the SIS vendors to situate. The, the software and to connect to WISE data. Um, as you, you know, get more data, you can feed it into your SIS and it'll you know, automatically be passed to the state and that's kind of an ongoing process, I believe, so. Yeah, it is, exactly. The data is always flowing. Um, you know, I'd recommend long-term that you try to integrate the process into the SIS because that's gonna make it the, hopefully the most fluid process. Um, we highly encourage the SIS vendors to work it into any online registration process. Um, so the parents are actually answering uh, the question. Some of the vendors met that, um, you know, in time for the school year, some uh, didn't quite get there. So they just had it in the course SIS product. But yeah, it's an ongoing collection. Get it into the SIS if you can, that consolidated repository. And that makes it the easiest way to share it with the state as well. Great. A um, couple more questions. One from Ryan, are there more resources coming that we can give directly to families? Uh, yes, so the CISA purchasing, um, CISA purchasing um, providers, the internet hardware and software providers are constantly being updated as um, vendors want to join the digital matrix and be partners in closing the gap. On the DPI website for broadband, which was also shared, where we saw the link to the internet access survey, there are a variety of resources available, including um, there's a PSC hotline that families can call and talk to a dedicated staff member to find out about uh, service and discounts in their area. There's a Wi-Fi map that the PSC put together with uh, free Wi-Fi access throughout the state so you can look in your area and see where you might be able to hop on. There are also links to a variety of um, internet offers and programs and we're constantly updating those links. Uh, one of the ones I can highlight is a Lifeline program and that's one where families can apply directly to the FCC for about um, a $10, it's about a $10 discount per month on their service um, when they qualify. So there are resources that uh, families can use directly as well. Great, and, and just to continue, this is more of a comment, I think, um, just that subsidizing the residential internet is very helpful in cases where that internet is available and families have an inability to afford or unwillingness to purchase it, but just kind of calling out the challenges of cases where traditional internet is not available 
um, and discounts are not available to those families. So definitely agree with that. Um, there's one more question here from Mark. If I understand correctly, we as schools are going to have funds to help provide service to families without service currently. Any perspective on how to address the issue of families who could have service but chose not to, and now the school is paying while many families are paying their own cost for service? Um, I'd like to answer that one. I think that, you know, as schools, we provide uh, free and appropriate public education for our students, and we want to connect families, um, districts, um, also as part of their planning, uh, maybe considering having, utilizing the, the internet already available in their schools and libraries, and providing opportunities for um, students to connect that way. Um, there are a variety of options. Um, I would be interested in the person with that question um, emailing me directly so that I could uh, respond back more in detail. It's a great that question. Sounds, that sounds good. Um, and let's see, he says, thank you for that answer. I will contact you. Great. Well, we are exactly on the hour. It's 11 o'clock. So um, thanks to all the presenters for sharing all this great information today. Thank you for all the attendees for making time uh, on this busy day. Hope everybody has a good Friday and has a good weekend and look out for a follow-up with the recording and presentation and information soon. So thanks everybody. Bye-bye.